This podcast contains explicit language. All right, and back. This is, this is Carlos. This is Dave. Do you think I suck games and friends? Kiki and, and Poe. Yay, you said Kiki this time. Yes, yeah, I did. I, I didn't introduce you to in the last episode, which we totally recorded not two minutes ago at all. And I just split the Audacity file into two so we could get two episodes out of one. Topic roundtable. Topic one, guns reloading. Why is it shitty? Dave, why is it shitty? I don't agree with you, dickhead. No, no, you agree. Because reloading guns is stupid. I loved when I could just hold down a button, and as long as I had ammo, my gun kept firing. Now, it's like, I, don't I, I saw least. five bullets, six bullets, now I have to reload, reloading I my do, gun. I don't agree. Do you prefer the Doom style of uh, shooting and stuff? I want infinite clips in all my guns. What about in the light railing games where you have to shoot off screen to reload? That's still well, reloading. Like yeah, that's what I just said. You said light railing. And yeah, you still have oh, to... You got same thing! Yeah, but you still have to uh, cock your gun to the side to reload. I know. This is so dumb. It's like... No, I don't agree. It's like look, 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 at, look at Gears of War. Gears of War did that great. Holy fuck. With the Hold fucking on. dogs! <laughs> oh my! <laughs> oh my! Some punk kids uh, skateboarding in front of the house. Fucking punk kids! Fucking punk kids! Next topic: punk kids and games. Why are they such punks? <laughs> anyway, back to the whole reloading thing. I see why you won't like it because as you're reloading, you're getting shot at, and you're like, "Fuck! I need to fucking load my gun." Oh, oh, great! I don't have enough bullets. Shit. This is point five Damn seconds. It. Like there we go. This is point five seconds of non gameplay in my game. I need to be stimulated at all times. Well, I I see what they because some people want more realism in the game and they're like, well, it's realistic to reload your gun and it's more strategy, so you don't just sit there holding the button. You have to actually think about when you're gonna shoot and like. And it helps you not waste your bullets, so every shot basically counts. But at the same time, when you're, like, in the middle of heavy fire, that could kind of be really irritating. I I, I see why it's there, though. To play devil's advocate to my own point, as Dave mentioned this earlier, and then I got very angry for no reason, <laughs> I kind of like it in Gears of War, because Gears of War is a tad more strategic, I want to say, methodical, tactical, I don't know what the best word is, but as I mention often, very underrated game by by quite a few people, it's very well made, and part of the reason it's very well made is that you have to consider how you approach a situation, and part of that is your active reload, which is a little real-time element that makes you do more damage with that gun for a set amount of time, and I was okay with it there, because it felt like an organic part of gameplay. I didn't care that it was about realism, because I don't give two shits about realism in my games. I cared that it felt right. It felt good to have to reload in this game. It did not feel good in Doom 3. I will admit it doesn't really feel good in Halo. I don't really like the concept of it in a lot of games. I kind of want to keep shooting as long as my ammo permits. And maybe this is because I played a lot of Mega Man when I was growing up. But I kind of don't want to be limited by a reload thing, because that whole feature was not a big thing in first-person shooters until, I don't know, 1997-ish? And then all of a sudden, every game was like, oh, we gotta have reloading in our games, because real guns need it, so our games need it. And it never really made much sense to me, unless the game was designed intelligently around it, like in Gears of War. Well, I mean... For me, the the biggest one that, that pissed me off on that was Mass Effect. I mean, I didn't like when they brought in thermal clips um, to, to get around, oh, well, we don't want people to just uh, have infinite ammo to be able to do whatever the fuck they want. That That's the one place I'll, I'll have agree with you in this case. See, other, in Mass other Effect than one, that, I think reload needs to be there. I don't think that infinite ammo, just hold down your button and shoot... I, I, really makes it fun. I I never said infinite ammo. I said infinite clip. I know what you're saying. Okay, yes. sorry. Infinite clip. Um, <laughs> well, 
as I recall, in Mass Effect and, and, 1. And that's how I see the, the person complaining about that, doing I want to put it for the game because I don't want to be like, blah, blah. Shut the that's fuck just, up. That's just fucking racist, Dave. As I recall, in Mass Effect 1, you had infinite ammo, but your gun could overheat if you used it too much. Yes. Sequence. I'm totally okay with that. I'm okay with so was I. overheat because that's a little more organic to me. Just stop firing for a little bit and let your gun ready. It's much better than having to watch your guy go through his Unreal Engine animation to show the cameras, look, look, kids, this is a real gun, like in real life. It, it doesn't strike me as terribly useful. I'd like to hear oh. from Poe and Kiki on this topic. Wait, uh, you guys already I've waited. I've come up fence, too, about how uh, reloading is both kind of dumb, and in certain games, it's a strategic point. But uh, all in all, I think I'd rather just... To stay with the Doom 1 and 2 style, just like being able to run and gun through shit, not having to worry about reloading. Uh, but you just ran out of bullets in Doom. Until you're out of ammo, yes. Well, that was my topic. I've calmed down a bit now. Less angry. New anger life balance. Who wants to go next? I can. Go! So I don't forget. Very quick and simple topic. Are infinite lives in games good or bad? The only game... Well... I guess it depends on the game, really. But the two games I was thinking of right now, I was thinking of Kirby's Epic Yarn, yeah. which I haven't really finished. I'm not too sure if it's just that I don't like the game or if, if I haven't given it a fair chance yet. I have played it for a little bit. I have been really sleepy every time I played it. Maybe it's just because it's so cozy. I don't know. But it's Coming from the girl who falls asleep to watching Carlos play Gears of War 3. I fall asleep through that or fighting games. It's just the noise is just so cozy. Versus a game like, well, the one I was thinking of was Sonic Adventure, for example. It, or even Mario, uh, any 3D Mario game. Is there a point of even having lives in those games? Because you can get like 99 lives right away. Is there even a point of having the life counter there? Like, I don't think there's a point in something like Mario because really you... Yeah, the There's that one video we made where we got infinite lives by me holding the little star dude in, what was that one called? Mario Galaxy, wasn't it? it was Mario yes, Galaxy Mario Galaxy. Too. And we... I was your little star buddy, and I was holding the enemy still, and you just jumped on him for lives. Yes. And yeah. so is, is there even a point? Oh, in... that, was a, that was one of the worm guys. It, it, it was actually a, a one, of the, one of the Koopa Troopas. We put the video up on YouTube. Uh, so yeah. this is a topic I wrote a Bitmob article about. And here's the basic gist of that article and my whole thought on the matter. Uh, live systems are mostly pointless if you're going to just throw one-up mushrooms at the player like bullets in a cave shooter, you might as well just take the life counter out. Mario 3D Land has a hundreds digit in the life counter. Even it's Nintendo Sonic knows 4. it's stupid. Sonic like, 4 also has a hundreds counter in their lives. Jesus fucking Christ. Like, Here's the thing. Just make the one-up mushroom worth a bunch of points and take the lives out. In a game like that, they're pointless, because if you run out, you just lose whatever checkpoint you were at in whatever level you were in. And that's not even a big penalty. In some games, like the horrible Mega Man X6, you didn't even lose your checkpoint. You had to remember not to continue, or the game might put you back at a checkpoint, which in that game might be impossible to traverse. But that's more of a design flaw with X6 than a live system. I'm okay with a live system if it makes sense in the game. Like in Jamestown, you get two lives and two credits. Or if you're playing multiplayer, just two credits, because the way multiplayer works. And you can either choose to tackle a level at a time, or the whole game in one shot with that system. And it's kind of balanced around having those lives. Like, you might get an extra life from points. But it's more about score. In Mario, the goal is platforming and traversing the level, and lives are pointless in it. Would you I say the same for Gunstar Heroes or Contra or something like that? Well, uh, later... Contra's a hard one for that. In the... The Contra was made to be super freaking hard, so you need the live system, I think. Yeah, but in those last two Contras, like the one with the, the 2D one, and then the one after it with the Samurai. The thing is, you could still pick your stage, and then they give you a set number of lives, 
for that stage. I'm all, I'm, I'm totally okay with that, right? Like, it's not like you need to earn a one up in stage one to kind of carry you through stage three. And even that would be fine if that's how the game was made. But the game was being made to tackled one level at a time. And part of the caveat is you get two tries at this. I'm okay with that. Maybe if that's how Mario levels worked, I'd be okay with that too. That's kind of how N plus worked. You had infinite lives, but you had to beat levels in groups of five to reach the next checkpoints. You could pick it directly, yes. right? Oh yeah, I love N plus. That's okay. Game. Yeah. But yeah, I think there's a point for it, and the point, uh, the place for it is not Mario, at least not anymore. Cool. Can't argue with you. Especially since you could just for once. skip a lot of Mario three, like when they invented flying, you could just break a lot of game, you know, a lot of the stages in that game. That's why they had to nerf Mario's flight. Yeah, Mario never had flight again. Although in New Super Mario Brothers two, he has that raccoon tail, and screenshots show him flying. But I'm not excited for that game. I haven't been excited for Mario for some time. Bleh. Kiki, you good with your topic? I'm good. Delightful. Next topic. Well, I don't, I don't know if I've done this before, but I was gonna go with like alignments, like in-game alignments. Explain. Like, uh, in, like in story mode, like in storylines, where you get to choose whether you can be a good person, a bad person, like heavenly, hellish. A nice guy, a douche, etc. In games, and whether they and when whether those affect uh, the overall story of a game or not. Are you saying they should or? I'm I'm just saying that uh, it's like uh, it's like uh, games like Mass Effect and what how like uh, storyline and like character re- interactions change depending on whether you're like uh, on one of the two di- of the three different light or dark, light or dark, neutral. Like for Mass Effect or Law of Chaos Neutral for the Mega Ten series, etc. I I think some games shouldn't use it. Like in the first Mass Effect or in Jade Empire, the game didn't really have good and evil. It was more like you could choose between being a hard ass or a wuss. And the issue is that <laughs> it didn't really change the game ish. It kind of changed some dialogue, but the best way to play was to go hardcore one way or the other. Being neutral was not really of benefit, so it didn't really matter there. It kind of mattered in a game like, say, Ogre Battle, where your individual unit's alignment mattered statistically against yep. other characters, yep, but then it would it was easy to lose your desired alignment or gain it, like your Heavenly Lich or your Monstrously Evil Princess. I had the best team, and then I just trounced everything, so everyone started going evil. I'm like, no, stop, guys, stop, you're too awesome. No, you steamrolled through a good part of that game with that team. With my- about but that was, that was easy to make a team that could do that. The problem was, was you were nerfing yourself by doing it. No, you weren't. How were you nerfing yourself? Well, yes. just because your teams would start going all opposite alignments. Well, in some I, case, you wouldn't be able to get, get certain endings. Uh, no, that's only if you use the main character. The main character's alignment, like, the all the other groups, they can do whatever the hell they want, which is why at one point, my, uh, well, my, my evil princess lich team was just zero alignment. I just used them to fucking kill shit that I couldn't kill with my other groups, or the, I would purposely not level my holy groups for like two or three maps and have my evil groups just go and having a shit fest so that way I could keep my alignments. So there was a kind of a path strategy there if you wanted to do that way, but to keep my actual character from straying off into e- either path, I would kind of balance off when they would attack, when they wouldn't kind of thing. So it doesn't really affect your character. You had to watch mm-hmm. your reputation bar as well. Like, you could yeah. liberate towns with your zero alignment units until close to the end of the game. There was that wasn't there that one map though where they liked evil people, so you would have to use your evil people to liberate towns, or it depended I, on the actual town's reputation, right? The town actually had a reputation bar. No, no, I think it was that uh, any uh, town that had a low alignment, so you would get better praise if you liberated with low alignment characters. Uh, mm-hmm. Opposites, but true. 
Wow. It's been a long time since I thought about that game. Love that game. Not that great of a game, but I like it. It, it. There were a lot of good things about it, but way too much micromanaging of alignment and shit. Yeah. yeah kind of ruined it. Yeah, yeah. Ogre Battle, alignment. Poe, is there more you wanted to discuss on alignment in games or anyone? Yeah. No, I, well, anyway, you, you go first, David. Ultimately, I, I think the alignment system has begun, begun to become tiresome. I mean, yes, games want to try and give you options and make your decisions matter and stuff like that. But even Mass Effect, I'm sorry. I'm just not, I'm not getting it. I mean, yes, you can do, you get some obscure dialogue options like, um, if you do this, I'm going to rip out your heart and feed it to you or, Look, dude, just go my way or, and everything will be fine, sort of thing. But it just doesn't, they're shoehorning in a alignment system because they think it gives choice. When in reality, it's gotten old. We just don't care anymore. It, it's time for it to go, I think. It, it, it's, it's outlived its usefulness. It just doesn't really give us anything anymore. I agree with you that uh, it outlives its usefulness in games where uh, it, uh, you know, alignment and shit doesn't really affect, uh, it only affects like minor conversations, but it doesn't affect the entire like ending or plot of the story as a whole. What about alignment as in, for example, in RPGs, like I guess MMOs, you could say like Ion, for example, when you're either the good angel people or the bad ones, or in World of Warcraft where you're the uh, alliance or horde or whatever. Alliance or horde doesn't really uh, isn't really affected by alignment. Too. Yeah, that, that's not really alignment. That that's an actual choice of I'm going to play this group or that group. That's not really alignment. Okay, I just want I, I was the reason I was asking was because I didn't know if that's what you were also talking about. I thought you were talking about like any kind of alignment, but okay, I get it. Well, no, yeah, I mean, ultimately, you, you are right in thinking about as an alignment, but less in the way that we're talking here about, well, why the fuck are we having these alignment systems that you're earning towards? I even find it pointless in Knights of the Old Republic. I, I don't think there's, uh, like, I wouldn't say the system has to go. I think certain games need to drop the pretense, Bioware. I, <laughs> think you can still make a game where these choices matter and where it can affect the plot, but you have to design the game around that, which seems to be my answer for everything now that I think about it. But some games kind of just shoehorn it in, and it's not really a choice. And in Bioware games, I honestly don't feel like it's really a choice. It's more like a way for your character to sound. Do you want your character to sound rougher or sweeter? And that's <laughs> alignment. Whereas in Ogre Battle, it was a way to turn your wizard into a lich. Yes. I always had the best stuff in that game. Princess, yeah. two liches, two undead guys. Jesus Christ. Remember when I had four princesses at one point? <laughs> yeah. I, and I didn't know what to do with the fourth one. I was like, uh. <laughs> I'm just going to put her in the group with the other one. Fuck it. Four <laughs> princesses that use their holy text. Did you know that in the Super Nintendo version, there were some attacks called, like, they had very questionable names, like the one that was called Jihad, yep. which was a holy angelic attack, which they very stealthily renamed in the PlayStation 1 version. Yeah, I, I had the Super NES version. Jihad! Don't make me go NES Jihad on you. better because the PlayStation 1 took forever to load, too. Yeah, it's like, fight it out! 30 seconds of loading. That's the battle theme. Ogre battle. Good. Good. Yes. Good. <laughs> All right. Paul, but, did you have more to talk about? Well, just one more thing. It's like, well, what I was talking about, like, alignment also, well, this is not like a mass effect where it's just like uh, the align, uh, what alignment you are determines what uh, dialogue choices you get, whether that doesn't, and it doesn't really matter to the plot at all. I'm talking about games like, uh, well, I think the prevalent one so far, it's like the Shin Megami Tensai series. Uh, where it focuses on uh, what what alignment you choose pretty much determines how what the ending will become. Because uh, you play through the game normally, 
Uh, you play through any one of those games normally. You fight the demon. You, know, you fight demons, pick them up as your party members and all that shit. But then you get to a turning point in the plot where you get to pick, where you get to pick your alignment. And sometimes it's automatically picked for you depending on any side quests that you do and whether whichever answers you picked. And once you pick one of the alignments, uh, it's, uh, you, you stay on that route until you, until the end and you get a different ending for it. So it's kind of like faction choice right at the beginning. No, not necessarily at the beginning because some games, so uh, it's like, uh, the, the decisions you do, it gradually, uh, leans you towards one faction or the other. Uh, you can do some things that also like uh, keeps you in the neutral, so that so that you can choose to either be uh, one side, the other side, or neutral. So what what what's your ultimate point mentioning this? Well, that's uh, like the sort of thing where alignment, uh, where your choice of alignment can ultimately determine to what ending you can get to. Yeah, but whether or not, uh, but it's hard to tell whether or not. Those alignments are like the canon and the alignment endings are the canon endings. Um, I, I, I guess the problem on this one here is that because none of us have really played those games, it's hard for us to really make any sort of comeback, whether that's good or bad. But we've played games like it. We've played games where we've gotten the our guy kills everyone ending, right? So I kind of get the gist of what Poe's talking about. Like, is it better when you can have that much control over the game's plot. Like that one game you can like, you know, you like too, where it's like at the ending you had to pick one girl and you have to sacrifice the other. Grand Stream Saga. Yeah, Grand Stream Saga, but that was a very hard choice. You got the choice right at the end of oh, the game. But that was like a, uh, it was like a choice to where it, your choice determined what ending you would get too. Uh, that yes. sort of thing. Yes. So well, I guess what I was wondering is, Bastion did that kind of thing as well with picking your ending and one was kind of good and one was kind of bad. One was the correct ending, as I like to call it. But anywho, do you want to talk more on alignment? No, I'm good otherwise. All right. Dave, there's only you. Well, I kind of did my overarching um, topic for t- for um, the last podcast. Yes, the last one we recorded in the long, long ago in the so far before this one. Uh, I guess I can go into... Metroidvania and how the Metroid style map system and gameplay has infected what I like to think of as the good Castlevania games, Hmm. but also how it's affecting more and more games that we're seeing, say indie games, as well as even the retail ones and how they're doing their systems as well. I don't have an issue with Metroidvania because as a big fan of Zelda 2 and Super Metroid, come to think of it, I... I'm okay with traversing these environments and going back and forth to try to piece things together and solve the overall game. Cave Story is definitely my favorite game in this vein. Now, that said, you can do them good or bad. Like, in Super Metroid, there was rarely a hallway where there wasn't something interesting going on or something you had to react to. As opposed to the fun but overrated Symphony of the Night where there are so many empty hallways and times you were going through the game where you were bored because nothing was going on or because the difficulty was tuned to the point that Alucard was just way too tough. Or too weak. Or too weak, which happened approximately right at the beginning of the game and never again. I don't know when... I actually just recently played through that game again, and, I mean, if you... I've never memorized the game, so every time I play it, I end up forgetting different things about it. But I definitely found that when you go across the the portal to the mirror castle, if you take the wrong turn, you're done. It's over. Yeah, I'm just going to say maybe you kind of suck. Just throwing that out there. (laughs) Eh, you suck. I really like the ones with Soma. The one I played was Donosaurus. I haven't played the other one, actually, now I think about it. Perfect. You would count Portrait of Ruin under this, right? Yes, uh, yes yeah. absolutely. I was not impressed with Portrait of Ruin, and I hated the fact that I just missed the spell heal throughout the fucking game, and I was like, how, how where did you guys get this? And they're like, you missed it. I'm like, oh, shit. Well, fuck, okay. 
I also couldn't really play. Oh, of the Ecclesia. one. Part, yeah, Ecclesia. That one was so ridiculously hard. I just stopped. I was like, no, I can't. This is just way too difficult. Like, the, like I think um, the one with Soma was my kind of difficulty where it wasn't too extreme, but it was difficult enough. Whereas Ecclesia, it was just fucking skyrocket. I'm like, I, I don't know. Dawn of Sorrow was definitely a little bit tougher than Symphony of the Night, though Soma could quickly out-level the challenge. And in Portrait of Ruin, the same thing could happen. And I think what happened in Order of Ecclesia is some angry guy at, at Konami <laughs> was like, Motherfuckers, calling my games easy? I'll fucking show them! And then hey. fucking threw three consecutive hard bosses at you right at the beginning of the game. Like, that one crab boss, I swear I had to try eight times to be that motherfucker. Yes. Was that the crab boss where you had to climb up? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that guy. Holy that shit. That guy was... Hey. Yeah, yeah, like, thanks, game. Give, make, that, make that guy the second boss or the third <laughs> boss. Like, give me a, th- a challenge where I can't fall right at the beginning of the game where I barely have weapons that can go down effectively. Thanks, jackasses. Hey, maybe it was the same people who did episode two for uh for PSO. That angry I fucking guy. Online. Yeah, that was a difficult difficult set of levels for Fantasy Star Online. But yeah, like I think with Metroidvanias, you still have to design them well. And a lot of the two D Metroids definitely keep you busy. And a lot of the two D Castlevanias, the Metroidvanias, kinda don't. And that's why they're a little overrated. Like it. Uh, Ego Raptor talked about it in his Castlevania 1 vs. 2 sequelitis, but even before I watched that, I kind of felt like the Metroidvanias were a tad overrated, and it's not because they're Metroidvanias, it's because their level design is not really favoring the tools, or maybe it's because Samus could shoot shit, and that was more melee, and they didn't really think about that too much, like, I don't know. Like, maybe it would have been better if these Metroidvanias had eight-way whipping. Unlike in Super Castlevania 4, where it was just broken, that would better fit a Metroidvania if you could whip in every fucking direction. And now the elaborate stage design could be creatively tackled because you have this tool at your disposal. But none of the games did that, so... Nah. Meow. Meow. (laughs) That said... I think Metroidvanias are a great genre. I really like them. Like, and Cave Story remains my favorite. And even all the shit I just talked about Metroidvania Castlevanias, I'll still play the next one when it comes out. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know you and I both played through Shadow of the Night. Did you Pretty much once Shadow of the fucking Night. <laughs> <laughs> you motherfucker. Symphony of the Night. <laughs> <laughs> that one was on purpose because I knew it would piss you off. It was not on purpose. You lied. Yes, it to was. Me. You are. You're covering. Is what I. No, nope. <laughs> not this time. Most times you're right. This time, fuck you. I think our one viewer will be the judge of this. Yay! And that would be me. You totally weren't lying. <laughs> you're lying. You're right. I totally weren't lying. I will punch you in the penis, <laughs> Metroidvania style, with my winged boots. And Puma Greaves. Can't forget Puma Greaves. Puma Greaves. Who else wants to talk but about yeah, Metroidvania? Yeah, no, Metroidvania, uh, I think things are going okay. I do think they're kind of not doing it justice, especially in the Castlevania games. You know what and I want to see more of? I'd really love to see another Castlevania game made for a, a next-gen system. You know, you know what I would like to see more of? Good first-person shooter Metroidvanias. And the only one I can really think of is Metroid Prime 1 on the GameCube, where I didn't have to use a fucking Wiimote. I like that one, too. Yeah, I would rate. Because that game felt a lot like a Metroidvania properly translated into 3D. Like, every room was unique and had things to to discover and do, and you found all the exits to a room so that you could proceed to the next one and figure out your objective there and piece stuff together, get new upgrades. It was very well made. In fact, if a 3D Castlevania wanted to emulate that game, I would not be unimpressed with it. If they do a better job than Curse of Darkness or uh, 
lament. Got the biggest sixty four one or Lords of Shadow. Yeah. Those dogs. Zombie <laughs> dogs. <laughs> Oh, that Richard, this round table seems to be a little shorter than usual. It's square. Oh, that too. The world well, is square. I, Spell it I backwards. Do have one, unlock the second airship. I, I do have one sort of subtopic. From what we've seen in the past, whenever Nintendo releases a new system, like the Wii, it was able to have backwards compatibility with its old game. Or old games, rather. Mm-hmm. Do you think the Wii U is going to have backwards compatibility? No. No. I, I, I think Nintendo has done that all of once, and that's the Wii having GameCube compatibility. True. I don't think, like, the GameCube didn't have N64 compatibility. Now, that said, their portables tend to be pretty backwards compatible. Will the Wii U play Wii games? Probably. Will it play GameCube games? No. No. Now, you've started touching exactly what I, where I was going with this one. We all know that if you stick a a Wii game into, say, your computer and run it with an emulator, you can get 1080p perfect running graphics. You from- can? Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's an emulator called Dolphin. You still have to use a proper Wiimote with it, and you have to buy a third-party sensor bar, but Dolphin will run most games in 1080p properly. In fact, that's how you play those custom new Super Mario Bros. Wii levels. And you're you're hitting my topic perfectly here, Carlos. So, with the proposed backwards compatibility with Wii games, are we going to see, seeing as it was the system itself that was holding those games back, will they look any better, or is Nintendo just going to emulate them so they look exactly like they are on the Wii? Well, given, given the nature of polygons... If they're being processed differently, they kind of have to look better. It's like playing a PlayStation 1 game on the PlayStation 2. To be honest, I think that Nintendo is going to actually put in a Wii limitation so it runs exactly like it was in the Wii. I don't think we're going to see any improved graphics at all. It would be just like Nintendo to do that. Kiki, you were about to interject with something. I was going to say there's no way Nintendo would do that because they're greedy fucks. <laughs> and I, I know you're grumbling in the back of your mind, Kiki. Kiki is like, what, I could run that at 1080p? (laughs) (laughs) A little bit, maybe. I agree with you. I agree with Kiki. Nintendo is not going to do it because, number one, they won't be able to sell the game again. And number two, they'd have to actually admit they made a mistake. Well, the Wii was a mistake anyway because... The Wii wasn't a mistake. It saved Nintendo's ass. But it was supposed to be on the GameCube. It was what supposed to be about? just an attachment. Is that actually true? Yeah. Not that I heard. Yeah. Neither. Wouldn't surprise me, but... The show showed me. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Sure. Yep. But yeah, no, I, I truly think Nintendo is going to just say, well, fuck you, it's going to emulate exactly like it was in the Wii because that's how we intended it. That, and I'm sure we're going to hear that exact phrase, too. Well, fuck them. I have, there are tons of indie companies doing Ninte- what Nintendo used to do well better than how Nintendo does it now. So fuck them. Fuck them right in the anus. Just killing time till Kiki <laughs> finds her stuff. Look but yeah, no, stuff. Tr- truthfully, I mean, that would be a really good thing on their part because I don't think that would stunt the sale of Wii games. I think that would actually increase it because all of a sudden, wow, my game can look that good. Just saying. I I think that would actually help them. Okay, I found the article here. The Who did the article? The joystick. Okay. And it says, Patton shows me what was the original GameCube peripheral. Here, I'll send... Do you want me to put give you guys the link so you take a peek? No, 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 no. It, it's, yeah. it, it, uh, it's all right. We have some source. And the there's an image where it shows the figures where you put these little two uh, readers on each end of the TV instead of just one bar. And you would plug in one of the game, like uh, one of the controller slots is where the remote sensor would go. And it actually shows pictures of showing this guy using a left and right swinging motion. You know, that huh. actually makes sense. It's not like the Wii was that much more powerful than a GameCube. And uh, one example of the game they showed was Mario Tennis. Like it shows a little Mario and it shows him how to hit the ball and stuff. You know, th- this totally makes sense. 
Like, but even yeah, like guess... the wave bird. You know how the wave bird had that little attachment thingy? Oh, yeah, where, the wave bird. Where you click it right on in? That's how it was supposed to be. I huh. see. Intriguing. Well, Nintendo ultimately made the right financial move in not doing that, clearly. I just wish that, in addition to being financially successful, they were also still making amazing games. And not... Or even just better than mediocre games. Like, fuck. Grrr! Dave, you good on your topic? Yeah, I'm good on the topic. I got, got what I wanted out of it. Delightful. Are we good for this episode, friends and Dave? I think so. No. No? Nice. I'm kidding. Yes. Oh, okay. Good <laughs> one. <laughs> All right. This has been David. And Nicky McDonald's. Too many talk games. And whoa. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Everyone, just scream at the mic. Ramble incoherently for a bit. That'll be our ending. Hmm? <laughs> 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 <laughs>